Good morning. I'd like you to turn, please, to the book of Joel and chapter 3. I'm going to read the first 17 verses. I realize we still have one verse to deal with in chapter 2. We'll, we will get to that. But for the sake of reading, I want to read chapter 3, verses 1 through 17. And uh, we're going to be uh, thinking particularly about the subject of divine retribution in this particular section. So beginning in verse 1, it says, For behold, in those days and in that time, when I shall bring again the captivity of Judah and Jerusalem. I will also gather all nations and will bring them down into the valley of Jehoshaphat and will plead with them there for my people and for my heritage, Israel, whom they have scattered among the nations and parted my land. And they have cast lots for my people and have given a boy for an harlot, and sold a girl for wine, that they might drink. Yea, and what have ye to do with me, O Tyre and Zidon, and all the coasts of Palestine? Will ye render me a recompense? And if ye recompense me swiftly and speedily, will I return your recompense upon your own head? Because you have taken my silver and my gold, and have carried into your temples my goodly pleasant things. The children also of Judah and the children of Jerusalem have you sold unto the Grecians, that you might remove them from their border. Behold, I will raise them out of the place whither you have sold them, and will return your recompense upon your own head. And I will sell your sons and your daughters into the hand of the children of Judah, and they shall sell them to the Sabaeans, to a people far off, for the Lord hath spoken it. Proclaim ye this among the Gentiles, prepare war, wake up the mighty men, let all the men of war draw near, let them come up, beat your plowshares into swords and your pruning hooks into spears. Let the weak say, I am strong. Assemble yourselves and come, all ye heathen, and gather yourselves together round about thither. Cause thy mighty ones to come down, O Lord. Let the heathen be wakened and come up to the valley of Jehoshaphat. For there will I sit to judge all the heathen round about. Put ye in the sickle, for the harvest is ripe. Come, get ye down, for the press is full, the fats overflow, for their wickedness is great." multitudes, multitudes in the valley of decision, for the day of the Lord is near in the valley of decision. The sun and the moon shall be darkened. The stars shall withdraw their shining. The Lord also shall roar out of Zion and utter his voice from Jerusalem. And the heavens and the earth shall shake, but the Lord will be the hope of his people and the strength of the children of Israel. So shall ye know that I am the Lord your God, dwelling in Zion, my holy mountain, then shall Jerusalem be holy, and there shall no strangers pass through her any more. And again, God will bless that reading from his precious word to us this morning. So we want to begin just by uh, finishing some loose ends from last time where we were looking at the blessings that the Lord is going to give to a repentant nation, Israel. And we saw that initially those blessings were physical, but then they moved to the spiritual. When we got to verse 28, that he'd pour his spirit on all flesh, and so that there would be a, a revival amongst the, the nation of Israel in the last days. And we, we get to verse 32, which is the verse that we did not get to uh, think about. And it goes this way. It says, it shall come to pass that whosoever shall call on the name of the Lord shall be delivered. For in Mount Zion and in Jerusalem shall be deliverance, as the Lord hath said, and in the remnant whom the Lord shall call. Now, despite the fact that Israel's spiritual blessings are going to come to them, after a time of solemn judgment, it's going to be after what we call the day of Jacob's trouble, uh, uh, that they're going to, uh, as it were, come to repentance. They're going to cry out to the Lord. 
And so despite the solemn judgments of that day, and we've looked at some of them uh, in the previous verses, we saw verse 30, I'll show wonders in the heavens, in the earth, blood and fire, pillars of smoke, sun shall be turned to darkness and moon and unto blood before the great and terrible day of the Lord. So solemn judgments taking place, but not everyone will be doomed in that day of the Lord. Salvation will be experienced in Jerusalem and in Zion. And so, uh, and also further afield, because uh, also the a remnant whom the Lord shall call. So uh, certainly there will be a deliverance experienced during this time of tribulation. And so as we come to the climax of the tribulation, and we, we know the story well, Israel surrounded by enemies, and then uh, God is going to send upon them a spirit of grace and supplication. They're going to look on him whom they've pierced. And in that context, uh, basically, we read this scripture, whosoever shall call on the name of the Lord shall be delivered. And so, of course, we think about this this word whosoever, uh, again, it's it's speaking specifically here, I think, to the nation of Israel uh, that will be there in that day, uh, surrounded by their enemies. And so uh, it's open to any individual at that time to cry for oneself. It's an individual thing. It's kind of human responsibility, individual responsibility, whoever shall call on the name of the Lord. Now, this salvation will only be experienced, I believe, by those who in helpless despair turn in their distress to the Lord alone. This call is one that recognizes the, the emergency, feels the danger, and in desperate need calls in faith upon the Lord, trusting in him and his power alone to deliver of course, we get this impression that uh, just as the triumphal entry, when the Lord came into Jerusalem, they, the people were crying out, Hosanna. And that word Hosanna means save now, save now. And I believe that in that very day, when, when Jerusalem is surrounded by enemies, the, the Jews will once again be crying out, Hosanna, Hosanna, with a sense of real urgency, save now, save now. And then the Savior will come. <laughs> Uh, and uh, uh, and they'll look on him whom they've pierced. And, of course, we all know the story, how devastating that will be to them when they realize that the one who is coming to their rescue is the one who they despised and rejected. And so in their dis desperation, in their despair, they they call out to him to save them. Now, it also there's no thought of human merit here. Uh, you know, some people, uh, especially of the more Calvinistic bent, you know, they, they don't want any kind of human aspect in it at all. It has to be all somehow miraculous conversion. And, and calling on the name of the Lord is not a work. Uh, it's it's coming to the, the point where we realize there's nothing I can do. My only hope is in him. And so really, there's no thought here whatsoever of human merit or human ability they, they recognize unless the Lord saves them, they have no hope. They're, they're, they're going to perish. And so it, there's no thought of that at all. Now, what's so remarkable is when we look at Romans chapter 10, I want you to look with me at Romans chapter 10, where Paul quotes, uh, again, in the context of Israel and uh, God's dealings with that nation. But in uh, Romans chapter 10 and verse um Let me see now, uh, verse, I'm looking at Revelation. That's why I'm thinking that does not look right at all. So praise the Lord. It wasn't, I got the wrong text. It was that I'm in the wrong book. Romans 10, verse 13 is the verse I'm looking for. So here we go. It says, for whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Now, it's very interesting because in the context here, the Lord who they're to call upon is the Lord Jesus. Because we see back in verse 9, that if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus, shall believe in thine heart that God hath raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. For with the heart man believes unto righteousness, with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. So contextually, the Lord whom they're to call upon 
is clearly the Lord Jesus. He's the person in the context. But back here in Joel, when it says, whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be delivered, the word, as you notice there in Joel, is L-O-R-D capitalized. That's in King James, that's Jehovah, right? Or Yahweh, whatever one you prefer. Uh, but what's interesting is that as Paul, moved by the Holy Spirit, takes Joel's verse and then applies it in Romans chapter 10, what he's saying to us is this, that the Jehovah of the old is the Jesus of the new. It's just another one of these incredible affirmations of the absolute deity of the Lord Jesus Christ. And so I just love that. I love it when we see those things. We see it so frequently that you have to have an agenda not to want to see it. <laughs> and there are people out there that have an agenda. They don't want to acknowledge that Jesus is indeed God manifest in the flesh. But if you're just reading the text without any prior bias, it's so evident that the Lord Jesus is God manifest in flesh, that he is indeed that Jehovah of the old is the Jesus of the new. And so in a very real sense, his self-revelation in the person of his son will be the object of the soul trust in that coming day. Any Jew that's going to be converted in that day will cry out to the Lord Jesus. The one who they once said, away with this man, <laughs> crucify him, they will cry out to him and call upon him to save them. And you can imagine that will be a very humiliating thing for them. They've based their whole religious ethos on the fact that he's some apostate and all the rest of it. And you talk about repentance, you talk about a change of mind. What a change of mind that's going to be when they acknowledge who this is. And so uh, in our day today, it's the same thing. People are only saved by faith in the person and work of the Lord Jesus. It's a grave mis mistake to teach that people in any dispensation, past, present, or future, will ever be saved other than on the principle of faith. And so we, we want to acknowledge that it's only faith that saves. And of course, faith must have the right object, and that object is the revelation of the Son, the Lord Jesus, in Scripture, both Old and New Testaments. And so we see here that uh, back in Joel uh, 2.32, whoever shall call on the name of the Lord shall be delivered. For in Mount Zion, and of course, uh, and in Jerusalem, uh, in Mount Zion in Jerusalem shall deliverance, as the Lord hath said, and in the remnant whom the Lord shall call. Now, why in Mount Zion and Jerusalem? Well, that will be the focal point of the world's attention in the last days. Can we see some foreshadowing of that right now? <laughs> it's certainly very much in everybody's mind, isn't it? This is kind of the focal point of all that's going on in the world right now is that piece of real estate. So this city will be the focal point of world attention in the last days. It'll also command the attention of heaven. There'll be a place of great suffering in the days of Jacob's trouble. Uh, they're going to be they're going to be there, almost like in a Warsaw ghetto. All the Jews are going to be allowed to return. I think the man of sin will cooperate, will allow them to gather in one place with the thought that we're going to really get the final solution. Now we're going to wipe them out, get them together in one place, easy to. to to disperse of them, kill them out. Uh, all the nations will gather together. So this is going to be a place of D Jacob's trouble, kind of the epicenter of it. This, and, But it will also be the scene of this great deliverance. There shall come out of Zion a deliverer, as again back in Romans 11 and verse 26 we read, uh, and so all Israel shall be saved. As it is written, there shall come out of Zion the deliverer, and shall turn away ungodliness from Jacob. And so very clearly in this day, it says, whoever calls on the name of the Lord shall be delivered, or in Mount Zion in Jerusalem shall be deliverance. And that deliverance, again, is going to come from one place, from the Lord. He's going to bring their deliverance. There's nowhere else they can turn uh, at this point. Uh, there, there's no more uh, diplomacy 
uh, no more democracy that they can depend on, no more America that they can look to. Uh, the only place they can look <laughs> is to the Lord, and he will deliver them. And so uh, great word of salvation here. And notice uh, it's based on this certain promise. In verse, uh, again, 32, it says, Whosoever will call on the name of the Lord shall be delivered in an in Mount Zion in Jerusalem shall be deliverance. And notice this, as the Lord hath said. <laughs> it's based on his promise, as the Lord has said. That's why there'll be deliverance, because the, it's based on him, his character. He's promised that he's going to do this. And so, and then it says, and in the remnant whom the Lord shall call. And so perhaps not just the nation of Israel, but another remnant. Uh, we know that in the tribulation, uh, 144,000 are going to be calling a remnant right through the preaching, the, the two witnesses, uh, the, the angel flying through heaven. Uh, the Lord is calling men to repent and turn to Christ. And this is kind of the last opportunity. And so it, it talks about a remnant whom the Lord shall call. And, of course, we saw on the day of Pentecost when, again, Peter was using this very text. Um, he quotes these words in Acts 2, in verse 39, as he appeals not just to those men that are there, but in verse 39 it says, For the promise is unto you and to your children and to all that are afar off, even as many as the Lord our God shall call. And of course, God's call always comes through the preaching of the word, through the proclamation of the message of Christ and him crucified. And the call is going out to repent and believe the gospel, to trust in the Lord Jesus. And there will be a remnant delivered in Mount Zion. Now we come to chapter three. And chapter three is really kind of, I, I believe, the climax of the book in many ways and it's 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 a very helpful climax in some ways because what we're going to see here is that god is going to bring the armies of the gentiles to the valley of jehoshaphat he's going to bring them he's going to bring them all together and he's going to deal with them there the process of this is going to bring about Israel's repentance. Now, I want you just to think about this. Do you remember when we were looking at the earlier chapters, God brought an army of locusts. This army of locusts he brought into the land, that army brought devastation to the land. But it, it resulted in them calling a solemn assembly and calling out to the Lord in repentance. And then we went to blessing. Well, what we're going to see is that this locust invasion basically was a foreshadowing of another invasion, but this time not of locusts, but this time the invasion of all the Gentile armies, all the nations going to gather together in this valley of Jehoshaphat, and it will bring Israel to the place of repentance. And then there will be deliverance as they're brought to repentance. And then there will be unprecedented blessing. We, we won't get to that today, but Lord willing, next week we'll see verse 18 to the end of the book, the incredible millennial blessings that are to come. And so it's kind of almost like the early chapters through the locust was a foreshadowing of what the real teaching was of the letter or this, this prophecy is what God is going to do in the, the last days. And so notice in verse 1 it says, For behold in those days and in that time, when I shall bring again the captivity of Judah and Jerusalem. So this session of judgment has got a kind of time frame, in those days and at that time. Now I want you to notice that this this double phrase in those days and at that time, it's used elsewhere in scripture and it's always used in the same context and that is the restoration of the nation of Israel. And so I want you just to look at Jeremiah with me just for a moment, the book of Jeremiah, a couple of references, Jeremiah 33 and verse 15. Jeremiah 33 verse 15, in those days and at that time, 
So again, we get that same phrase, same phraseology in those days and in that time. And then it says this, Will I cause the branch of righteousness to grow up unto David, and he shall execute judgment and righteousness in the land. In those days shall Judah be saved. Jerusalem shall dwell safely. This is the name wherewith the Lord shall be called the Lord our righteous. So again, it's to do with Israel's deliverance and Israel's restoration. And of course, it's through Jehovah said, can you, the Lord our righteousness, that, that is all going to happen. And and so uh, now look at Jeremiah 50, Jeremiah chapter 50. And we're just looking at that little phrase, and in those days and at that time. And again, it's used rarely in scripture. And when it is used, it seems to be in the context of God's future restoration of the nation. Verse 4 of, of Jeremiah 50. In those days and in that time, saith the Lord, the children of Israel shall come, they and the children of Judah together, going and weeping, they shall go and seek the Lord their God. So, Judah and Israel coming together, seeking the Lord their God, verse 20 of the same chapter. In those days and in that time, saith the Lord, the iniquity of Israel shall be sought for, and there shall be none. By what a, what a wonderful promise. Uh, <laughs> right now, if you seek for iniquity uh, amongst the children of Israel, wouldn't be difficult to find it. Right, But in those days and at that time, the iniquity of Israel shall be sought for, and there shall be none. The sins of Judah, and they shall not be found, for I will pardon them whom I reserve. So again, the whole context is to do with Israel's final restoration to the Lord, their forgiveness of their sin, uh, all of their past transgressions being dealt with, they're being brought together, seeking the Lord. Uh, this is the time frame. And so contexts which speak of the restoration of God's people and at the same time, which speak of judgment of the Gentiles. And so he says, in back in chapter 3, for behold, in those days and in that time, when I, notice this, when I shall bring again the captivity of Judah and Jerusalem. And so he's talking about this end time regathering of the nation of Israel and Judah into the land where he can deal with them, where he can save them, where he can deal with their enemies. So this is really talking about the very last times as we uh, consider scripture. Now, of course, in a lesser an immediate sense, there was a kind of a prior fulfillment of bringing the nation back from Babylon and exile and so on and so forth. But this is the ultimate. We're talking about really the the, the last day scenario where Israel are going to be regathered to the point where um, they're, they're going to be uh, so desperate uh, that they're, they're going to cry out, as we've said, Hosanna and that then they will say to the Lord Jesus, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. <laughs> you see, uh, the Lord Jesus said, you're not going to see me until you say, blessed is he who comes in there. They're going to say that. This is, the, this is the, the time frame when these events are going to happen, when God turns away iniquity from Israel, brings deliverance to that nation. So how is that all going to come about? Well, he tells us not only is he going to gather them together, he's going to bring again the captivity of Judah and Jerusalem. He's going to bring them back to the land. He says in verse 2, I will also gather all nations and will bring them down into the valley of Jehoshaphat and will plead with them there for my people, for my heritage Israel, whom they have scattered among the nations and parted my land. The crimes of the centuries are not going to be settled in the European Court of Human Rights or on the floors of the United Nations. But the crimes of the centuries are going to be dealt with, especially towards his people Israel, in the Valley of Jehoshaphat. That's where God is going to deal with the nations and their treatment of his people. So <laughs> Joel here is describing what we know as as the, the Battle of Armageddon. We saw it in Revelation chapter 16. Um, 
so we might ask the question, well, why why does it say the Valley of Jehoshaphat, Jehoshaphat rather than Armageddon? It's interesting that nobody's ever found the Valley of Jehoshaphat. And so maybe the idea comes from the meaning of the name Jehoshaphat. And the name Jehoshaphat means the Lord judges. So he's going to bring them into the valley where the Lord judges. And we know that valley to be Armageddon. Now, in the historical record of Jehoshaphat's reign, there was a valley in which a coalition of Edomites, Ammonites, Moabites was destroyed. It was later called, as we, I think, discussed once before, the Valley of Berechiah, since it was the pr they praised the Lord for the deliverance. But there's no question that it is going to be what we know as the the, the Med Megiddo, that, that great valley. It's amazing when you stand on Mount Carmel and look at this valley. That's where uh, Napoleon stood and said that he could envisage all the armies of the world being gathered together in battle in this place. He thought it was the ideal battlefield. And this is where it's going to take place. And this is where the Lord will take up the cause of his despised people. God's complaint against the nations is that they have mistreated his people. Primarily, contextually here, it's the nation of Israel. Notice again it says, I will plead with them there for my people, for my heritage, Israel. And so, again, it's interesting how the Lord calls in this ch chapter, he talks about my land, he talks about my people, he talks about my heritage, Israel. And and so, again, we have to see here how anybody can read Scripture and not see a future for Israel is absolutely beyond my capability to take it in. It's just so clear that God has a future for this nation. He hasn't abandoned Israel. And it's not just based on Romans 9 through 11, but you have so many passages in the Old Testament that if you just dismiss them and say they're replacing the church, it makes God into a, a dishonest person who's making promises he's no intention of fulfilling with the people he made the promise to. It's just ridiculous. And so quite clearly here, uh, there's uh, God is, is upset with the nations because of their treatment of his people. And if we're in any question about who they are, he says, my people for my heritage, Israel. That's who he's talking about. Don't read there the church, Israel. He's concerned about how people are treated Israel. Now, of course, even in Matthew 25, where there's, there's going to be a judgment of the living nations. And what's going to be the basis of that judgment? The judgment is, how did they treat my brethren? Who are his brethren? His kinsmen, according to the flesh. Israel. Their treatment of Israel is going to show whether they really believed in God or not uh, in the way that they treated Israel. Zechariah 3, 2, verse 8. We've looked at it many times, but it simply says this. He that toucheth you toucheth the apple of his eye. And so it's to, to treat Israel badly from a national standpoint is like poking God in the eye. <laughs> it's a very, very serious thing. And so we want to just acknowledge this. It's, and the nations uh, are going to be judged severely because of this. So the crime of the nations and their doom is all connected with how they've treated the nation of Israel. So what is their treatment connected with? Well, whom they have scattered among the nations, and they have parted my land. Two indictments against them. First of all, the scattering of the people among the nations. Uh, Gentiles have got a pretty good record of that, right? The Babylonians did it. The Romans did it under Titus. And so scattering his people and then dividing up his land. Uh, isn't it amazing how even now there's strong talk coming that the only solution is a two-state solution, right? What does that in, 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 entail? Dividing up God's land. Listen, America has no business dividing up God's land, nor does any other nation or group of nations. It's God's land. It's his land. 
and and to divide up is a very serious thing. And so these nations are going to be brought into this valley because the land that he promised to them. Now, again, you see see why all this is so serious is because it's the reversal of what God has done. God brought Israel out of the nations into the land, right? He called Abraham out of Ur the Chaldees, said, I'm going to give you this land. So it's reversing, going completely against what God has done. God brought the nation there. And so on the one hand, it's bringing it, and then he gave them this land, and then so dividing it up to others, when God had given it to them, again, it just shows it's it's contrary to God's purpose. They're going directly in the face of what God has said. And again, you can see behind this is nothing other than the enemy, Satan. <laughs> he hates God. He hates everything that God initiates. He's opposed to it. Uh, he's, the, he's the opponent, the adversary. And so he's behind this in every way. Throughout history, we've seen this uh, scattering of the nation among the nations. We, As we mentioned, we saw it in Babylon. In AD 70, the Roman general Titus killed one and a half million Jews and sold thousands into slavery in a three-month period alone. That three-month period when he sold these Jews into slavery... Actually, you know, the supply and demand, slave prices plummeted because there was such a glut of slaves on the market that you could almost get one for nearly nothing. <laughs> it was incredible. And again, this is, again, these nations. And of course, I believe that uh, Titus, uh, a revived Roman Empire, is going to be part of what's going to be assembled here in this great battle of Armageddon against uh, God and against his people. And so I just want to, uh, I could talk a little bit too. Uh, maybe I'll just take a minute just to say this. Now, of course, we say all this replies to Israel. But don't forget too that the Lord takes it personally when people attack his people today, the church as well. <laughs> Saul of Tarsus, remember, why are you persecuting me? <laughs> you touch the body on earth, you affect the head in heaven. When we were doing Revelation, we talked about the, the the persecutions under the successive Roman empires or Roman emperors. Um, we didn't do this at the time, but I want to just take a minute. I only take a minute to do this, but I want to just go through quickly those ten Roman emperors and what how how things worked out for them when they dared to touch the church. And what we could say is this. They didn't all live happily ever after. <laughs> there are consequences. So I'm just going to run through it really quickly. These 10 emperors, Nero, first one who inaugurated persecution, he lost 30,000 of his subjects by pestilence, had his armies utterly defeated in Britain, suffered a revolution in Armenia, was hated so much by his own senators in Rome that they forced him to kill himself. So it it wasn't a very happy ending for Nero, was it? Uh, Domitian was butchered by his own soldiers. Trajan died of a foul disease. Severus died miserably on a military campaign in Britain. Maximus was cut in pieces together with his son. Uh, Decius died as an exile in a far country. Valerian was whipped to death as a captive of the king of Persia. Aurelian was killed by his own soldiers. Diocletian poisoned himself. Maximum hanged himself. And so the point is simply this. Do not mess with God's people. It's a very serious thing, whether it's his ancient people, Israel, or whether it's the church of the living God, there are serious consequences with, with treating badly his people. So verse 3, he says, and they have cast lots for my people and have given a boy for a harlot and sold a girl for wine that they might drink. So cast lots for my people. It's bad enough for a man to regard any human life as cheap. It's worse to regard the people of God as cheap, something to be gambled for. And that's what they were, again, pr slave prices became so low after Titus, for instance, that you could gamble for a slave, you know, and whoever, you know, won the lot uh, 
got the slaves. That was the idea. And so Palestine, Palestine, the land of, of Israel or whatever had been a plundered land. Many Gentile nations have robbed the Jews of wealth that is rightfully theirs. God is going to recompense them in the day of the Lord. And so, again, sadly, given a boy for a harlot. Now, is this given a boy for the price of a harlot or is it selling them into harlotry? You know, I'm not surprised if that would be the case. Sold a girl for wine. Uh, again, just the price of, of getting drunk. You could buy a girl. And this is, this is, and again, I, I just, I, I think of the, the evil that has gone on throughout the generations. Uh, even now, all this stuff that's going on about Epstein and the island, you know, and all this kind of stuff. The number of children that have been the object of such heinous treatment, the law judges, a day of accountability is coming. Thank God there is a day of accountability. And by the way, thank God that our <laughs> our day of accountability took place the day we were saved in the sense that <laughs> he dealt with our sin at Calvary. But, but again, God is going to deal with these things. He takes these things seriously. And so verse 4, he says, Yea, and what have you to do with me, O Tyre and Zidon, and all the coast of Palestine? Will you render me a recompense? If you recompense me swiftly and speedily, will I return your recompense upon your own head? So Joel is citing instances of Gentile maltreatment of his people from recent and contemporary history. Such instances could be mentioned as far back as Joel's own time which demonstrates this hatred of God's people is an old hatred. It goes all the way back, doesn't it? Not just to Joel's time, but goes even further back, really, to the days of Esau, right? So, I mean, we're talking about a long history of anti-Semiticism, which is, I think, reaching boiling point in our present time. And so um, he deals with two tiny little nations really here he's, he's dealing with phoenicia, phoenicia which would be tyre and sidon and then he's dealing with um the the coast of palestine which would be the philistines so two two relatively tiny national entities tyre and sidon and and the point is this if god is going to deal with these lesser nations for their treatment of israel don't think that he's going to miss the bigger nations, right? In other words, he's, he's, he's saying, I'm dealing with these small nations. Uh, I'm not overlooking what they did against my people, Israel. I won't overlook what other bigger nations did either. And of course, these nations, what they had in common was that they were on the Mediterranean coast. And so they were in a very good point uh, to be able to sell God's people into slavery. Uh, right, they 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 had the the ports, they had the sea coast, and so this is the idea. These nations were positioned to take advantage of maritime trade, and one of the things that they traded in were God's people. These boys sold into harlotry. These girls uh, sold for wine. Uh, this is why their God is going to deal with them. Uh, and so He says, "What have you to do with me?" Or, or He's asking, "What have you got against me?" really, that you would treat my people in this way. Have they any just cause for, for treating the Lord this way because of the way they treat his people? And the second question is, will you render me a recompense? In other words, what what have, what have I done to you that you would, you would pay me back in, in such a terrible way? He's not guilty of any evil towards them. In fact, their blessed position is, again, is, is a mark of his goodness that they're there on that Mediterranean coast. So why, why are you doing this against me? And then he says, I will return your recompense on your own head. He'll respond in righteous retribution. That's why we're calling this chapter divine retribution. God is, payday is coming. Payday someday. God is going to pay up. He's going to deal with these people for what they have done. And so notice he says, I'll return your recompense on your head. And how is he going to do it? If you recompense me swiftly and speedily, will I return your recompense on your own head? Now, I want you to look at a, a verse in Jeremiah. 
chapter 51, Jeremiah 51. And again, this is letting us know that God, God will get back against these people who have treated him and his people so badly. Jeremiah 51 and verse 56, quite a verse. You don't, I don't think I've ever heard anybody preach on, on, on this, this idea of God of recompense. He says in verse 56, because the spoiler is come upon her, even upon Babylon, and her mighty men are taken, every one of their bows is broken, for the Lord God of recompenses shall surely requite. Right? You know, I've heard messages on the names of God, but what about this? The Lord God of recompenses. Uh, God is going to get back. He's going to deal with these things. He's going to deal with these nations. And so he is going to bring retribution swiftly and speedily. And of course, because he's omnipotent, he can choose his own time and his own way, but he will pay back these people for what they have done. Tyre and Sidon would indeed pay a heavy price for what they did, so would the land of the Philistines. Verse 5, because you have taken my silver and my gold and have carried into your temples my goodly pleasant things. So they have plundered God's land and misappropriated some of his treasures in order to enrich their own palaces and temples. Now, again, it's interesting, just this idea of my silver, my gold, my goodly, pleasant things. And when I read that this morning, I was just going over it and didn't have this in my notes, but the thought that came to me very powerfully is this. The earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof. Psalm 24, verse 1. It belongs to him. He owns everything. <laughs> so when they're taking this stuff and distributing it and using it for their own, they're taking it from him. It's his his silver, his gold. So the Lord um, is is going to deal with these nations that have enriched their own palaces and temples by taking his things. Now we have a, an example of this in a in a very contemporary sense in this particular book. Something that happened in relatively recent memory uh, of Joel writing, where they took of the Lord's things. And if you look at 2 Chronicles, I want to just see an example here, in 2 Chronicles 21. 2 Chronicles chapter 21, verses 16 and 17. <clears throat> it says, Moreover, the Lord stirred up against Jehoram, the spirit of the Philipp Philistines and the Arabians, and that were near the Ethiopians, and they came up unto Judah and break into it and carried away all the substance that was found in the king's house and his sons also and his wives, and so that there were never a son left him save Jehoahaz, the younger of his sons, and so here's an example where the Philistines took the substance they found in the king's house and his sons also, and so on and so forth, and they took them and plundered them. Now, that would be relatively recent history as Joel is writing his book. Remember where we placed him uh, after, uh, after Jehoshaphat in those early days uh, during um, the uh, that time when the kingdom was, there was no king because the, the young king was only eight years of age. And and, and so basically uh, that fits in. that This was in relatively recent memory. The Philistines had done that. So we've got recent history here that behind this. Notice verse 6. The children also of Judah, the children of Jerusalem, have you sold to the Grecians that you might remove them from their border. Now those that give an older date to the book of Joel than we have given uh, the reason they do that is because the mention of the Greeks here. They say, well, Greeks, you know, the Greek Empire did not come uh, until 332 to 363 BC. And so this can't be written uh, as early as uh, we're saying. However, what we would say is this. The Grecians as a people, they may not have had an empire, but their existence, there are records of Greece mentioned in Egyptian literature 
e Egypt's Tel Al Amarna tablets around 1300 BC. So the Greeks as a people existed. They just want an empire. <laughs> and so uh, we have other examples of Greeks being mentioned by, by Assyria in the time of Sargon II, 722 to 705 BC. And so, so although Greek, Greece didn't become a mighty empire, it existed as a people and were traders uh, that go back uh, even to the 1300 years before Christ. So uh, children of Judah and the children of Jerusalem have you sold to the Grecians that you might remove them far from their border. And so they sold them. Tyre's slave trade uh, is well known. They were very involved in slave trading. Um, and we, we have another example of their slave trading activity in the book of Ezekiel, uh, chapter 27, when God brings a lamentation against Tyre. He says in Ezekiel 27 and verse 13, Jave and Tubal and Meshach, they were uh, thy merchants. They traded the persons of men and vessels of brass in thy market. And of course, this chapter, he's speaking of Tyre. And so in their markets, the uh, we read here, the persons of men, were one of the things that was traded. And so they were very involved in in selling men, basically. And so God is recompensing them for that. So in verse 7, now of our chapter, it says, Behold, I will raise them out of the place whither you have sold them and will return your recompense upon your own head. So God makes it abundantly clear that there'll, there'll be consequences for their behavior detailed in verse 5 and 6. And I guess we could say in New Testament language, we could say this. Galatians 6, 7 says this. What a man sows, that shall he also reap. What we call this, this law of sowing and reaping. It's an immutable law of God. And so they're reaping what they've sowed. God's people would eventually be freed. That's what he's going to tell us here. And these people themselves would be sold into slavery after they were conquered by Alexander the Great. And so we'll see here, uh, verse 8, I will sell your sons, your daughters, into the hand of the children of Judah. So the children of Judah would become middlemen in this. And they shall sell them to the Sabaeans, to a people far off, for the Lord hath spoken it and so here's an amazing thing god will be active in returning his own people from the place of captivity but he will also sell them into slavery vengeance is mine saith the lord i will repay so this judgment that the threatened here was fulfilled at least in part in the fourth century bc the people of Sidon were sold into slavery by Antiochus III in 345 BC, while the cities of Tyre and Gaza were enslaved by Alexander in 332 BC. Uh, what we find is so, so interesting is the Hebrews, who had no love for the sea, we don't think of them as a seafaring people. In fact, whenever they are, <laughs> they try to be a seafaring people, it doesn't work out very well. Their ships usually sink. Uh, they're just not a seagoing people. And yet they were sold to the Grecians as seafaring people. And so that was tragic. But now Tyre and Sidon and, and the coast of Gaza, who are more like seafaring people, they're sold to the Sabaeans, who are desert dwellers. <laughs> and so God has got a way of recompensing in a, in a remarkable way. And uh, we, we see that often in Scripture, don't we? Mur uh, the murderer of Pharaoh who wanted to drown all the young men uh, in the Nile, he and his armies are drowned in the Red Sea. God is really good at recompensing. Uh, and so we want to just acknowledge that. Verse 9, he says, Proclaim ye this among the Gentiles, prepare war. Now we're moving to another little section. We've already seen the crime. The crime is the way the nations have treated his people. Now, this is where he's going to bring them together to deal with them. 
And so he says, proclaim you this among the Gentiles, prepare war, make wake up the mighty men, let all men of war draw near, let them come up. So there's a lot of language now in the following verses about this kind of gathering together of, of armies preparing for war. Just interesting this week, I don't know if anybody heard it, but Sweden told its citizenship, two of key generals said, prepare for war. <laughs> kind of interesting. That kind of gets people a bit agitated when people do that. But Sweden have done that this very week. So there's going to be a proclamation made among the Gentiles. And this proclamation is prepare for war. And, and so the whole language here, we've got uh, this idea of coming up in, in verse 9, uh, verse 11, assemble yourselves uh, and come, and then cause thy mighty ones to come down. And so there's all this idea of coming together, this great assembling, this bringing together. And, and this bringing together, there, there's the nations, but also there's going to be uh, there's going to be a supernatural element to this too, in the sense that it, it, we read there again in verse 11, cause the mighty ones to come down, O Lord. This is the angelic hosts. And so this, this battle is going to be the armies of earth and also the very armies of heaven, God's host, going to be coming together in the battle of all battles, what we call the Battle of Armageddon. There's a call, a public proclamation to be announced throughout the Gentile world without specifying who's doing it, but God is behind it. God is, just as he brought the locusts, called them his army, he is going to be bringing the Gentile nations. They're all going to be calling for war, prepare for war, and the war is going to be against Israel. Initially, their goal, we are going to wipe out these Jews. They're the cause of all our troubles and all our problems. And if we want a world of peace and a world of safety and a world of security, we must eliminate these people. And so a preparation for war. But we'll have to wait until next week until we enter into the war <laughs> and uh, unless we're raptured and then we'll get a far better explanation of the rest of the chapter.